Hey these gents, how's it going? Random Gary here, aka Gary Proud, back with another a Gallantry reaction video. And um, big thank you uh, last week uh, to that video, um, the Bob Hughes from Lorraine, Ohio video. A fantastic reaction to it, love it. Um, I think I'm going to do a bit of a, a little show on that there. So so um, what I'm going to do is going to go out and find some more of the, the American graffiti on the trees. I, I've been made aware of a few more places where it's at and and see if we can track down these guys big thank you to nathan m uh brian smith and danny pjr danny pjr i i published the video i went straight to bed and it turns out that like within a minute you had you had figured out who it was and where they were from so so thank you um tonight uh today we're going to be checking out uh general john f kelly this is um him reacting to um his troops u.s marine corps in um ramadi i believe i think that's what it said in the comment section so let's check out this video and, and let's see what went on for these people gold star families of california is is that all recipients of um the gold star that's that's a gallantry award isn't it it's a really significant one over your way um or is this is this the gold star? I'm guessing that's potentially awarded to these two two young marines that it talks about. Hmm. Let me know. Is is there is there a formation set up like that in the states for people with gallantry awards? These two young men are not your loved ones, but they are exactly like your loved ones. They're cut from the same bolt of cloth and have the same kind of steel on their backs. On the 22nd of April, 2008, two Marine battalions, the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, the Walking Dead from Vietnam fame, and the 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, were switching out in a place called Ramadi, Iraq. One battalion was going home in a few days, and the other just starting its seven-month tour. This is a horrific time, handover, takeover period, because what the outgoing troops are doing is they're taking the new troops out and trying to give them a realistic appreciation of the ground and in order for you to take them around all of the areas and to, to fully brief them on it you have to take yourself into some of the most dangerous areas and it's a back end of your tour and all you want to do is get home probably at that point a lot of incidents happen in these handover takeover periods i think it i think it's mainly due to that exposure you put yourself in to be able to brief them i think our troops are too professional not to do a handover in the correct manner and rather than just let the new people figure it out, you, you, you do it thoroughly, hence why it's a dangerous time. Two Marines, Corporal Jonathan Yale and Lance Corporal Jordan Herter, 22 and 20 years old, respectively. One from each battalion. It's... They were assuming the watch together at the entrance gate to an outpost that contained a makeshift barracks housing 50 Marines. The same broken down ramshackle building was also home to 100 Iraqi police who are our allies. They were my men in this fight against the terrorists in Ramadi. Yale was a dirt poor mixed race kid from Virginia with a wife and a daughter and a mother and a sister who lived with him and he supported them as well on 13,000. You could just tell how busy a tour it's been. You, you see that kind of encrusted and a look around his body armor he's been out a lot he's been sweating into that he's been in the dirt this has not been one of those cushy tours dollars a year herder what was that was sorry middle class white kid from long island ah. and he supported them as well on thirteen thousand dollars a year thirteen thousand that that take home pay after taxes i think you americans do that there if it is it's probably close to what our privates would herder was a middle class white kid from long island the two of them were from two completely different worlds in our country not good not bad just different had they not joined the marine corps they would never have known each other they would never have even understood that multiple americas exist simultaneously depending on your education level your family's income status maybe but they were marines they were combat marines and because of this bond they were brothers as close 
as if they were born to the same woman. The mission orders they received from the sergeant, their squad leader, I'm sure, went something like this. Okay, you two clowns, stand this post and let no unauthorized personnel or vehicles pass. You clear on that? And I'm sure Yale and Herder then roll, Herder then rolled their eyes and said in unison something like, yes, yeah, Sergeant, we got it. We know what we're doing. Screw you. <laughs> boys, this boy's been there, done that, hasn't he? This this guy knows his troops. I always I always say the best leaders are the ones who can kick the dirt. And what I mean by that is, is they can they can stand around, they can have a chat with every rank within their command, and they can have meaningful, honest conversations. And it sounds like this bloke was all over it. Again, I'm prior enlisted. I know how they think. <laughs> Fire enlisted. So that does that mean that he joined up as a private and made it all the way to general? If so, that's incredible. So we've we've got a few colonels in our military. I think maybe one up, maybe a a couple of um possibly brigadiers, but I don't think we've got any generals who enlisted. My brother's actually a major, so he's a major now. Um, he joined up in 1988, still serving to this day. So yeah, they they really know the the reality. You could just tell it from what he was saying before. They were then relieved, two, two other Marines on watch, who as it turned out were probably the two luckiest Marines on the, on the earth that day. And they assumed those posts, Yale and Herder, at, at a place called the Entry Control Point at Nasser in the Safiya district of uh, Ramadi in Iraq. In any event, a few minutes later, a le very large blue truck turned down the, uh, the alleyway that was no more than 100 yards in length. It sped its way through the serpentine concrete walls, Jersey walls. The truck then stopped just short of where these two were posted. It detonated. It killed both of them catastrophically. And if you know what combat's like, you know what I'm talking about when I say catastrophically. 24 brick masonry houses were damaged or destroyed by the blast. A mosque 100 meters away collapsed. The truck's engine came to rest 200 meters away, and it knocked down a building before it came to rest. Our EOD guys, or explosive guys, reckoned that the blast was made by a bomb of at least 2,000 pounds of explosive. Two died, and because these two young infantrymen died, they didn't know how to run from danger. 150 men, 50 U.S. Marines, and 100 Iraqis were saved. When I read the situation report, a few hours after it happened, I called the regimental commander, Luke Craparata, and I asked him for details about what happened. It seemed different to me. Unfortunately, Marines dying or being seriously wounded is common in, com in combat. We expect Marines, and for that matter, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Coast Guardsmen, regardless of rank, to do their duty, to stand their ground, and to die if that's what the mission requires. The regimental commander had just returned from the site. He agreed with me, but reported to me that no American witnesses to the event. This, is this going down that route of has to be witnessed in order for it to be written up to be eligible to receive a gallantry award? I hope it is, and I hope and I'm hoping the policy and procedure is not getting in the way of of reality, shall we say? That there were no American witnesses, just Iraqi police. I figured if there was any chance of finding out what actually happened, and to recognize these young men for what they'd done, I'd have to go down there myself because I understood, unfortunately, that the bureaucrats in Washington would never accept. Iraqi statements for what had taken place. If, it, if there was any chance at all, it had to come under my signature. So I traveled to Ramadi the next day and spoke to half a dozen Iraqi police, all of whom told me the same story. They said the truck turned down into the alley and sped up as it made its way through the serpentine Jersey walls. They all said they knew immediately what was going on, particularly when the Marines began to fire. 
The Iraqis all began firing as well, then to a man ran for safety just prior to the explosion. They all survived. Many were injured, some seriously injured. But as one of the Iraqis said to me, sir, they'd run from the danger like any normal man would to save his life. What he didn't know until then, he said, and what he learned at that instant was that Americans are not normal. With tears welling up, he said to me, sir, in the name of Allah, no sane man would have stood there and done what they did. No sane man. They saved all of us. <laughs> what we didn't know at the time, what I didn't know at the time, and only learned a couple of days later, after I wrote a summary of statement of, these, of this bravery and submitted it, and submitted them, both Yale and Herder, for Navy Perfect. Crosses, Perfect. which is the number two award for Marines and sailors in combat. What I didn't know was that one of the security cameras we had at the location that was damaged initially in the blast had caught everything. And it happened exactly as these Iraqis described it to me. It took exactly six seconds by that recording from when the truck entered the valley until it uh, exploded, six seconds. And you can watch, and I did watch many, many times on this recording, the last six seconds of their lives. When it first started, I suppose it took about a second or so for the Marines to separately come to the conclusion about what was going on. They had no time to talk it over, only enough time to take half an instant and think about what the sergeant maybe had told them a few minutes before, let no unauthorized, unauthorized persons or vehicles to pass. At that point, I think, according to the recording, this Marine said, about five seconds to live. Think of it, five seconds to live. I don't think they knew it. They didn't have time. It took about another two seconds for the two jarheads to raise their weapons, to take aim, and to open up at that truck. By this time, the truck was halfway through the barriers and gaining speed the whole time. Here, the recording shows a number of Iraqi policemen, some of whom had fired their AK-47s, were now scattering like the normal and rational men they were, some running right past the Marines. The two Marines had about three seconds to live. For about two seconds more, the recording shows the Marines firing their weapons nonstop. The truck's windshield exploded into shards of glass as their rounds took it apart and undoubtedly tore into the body of the terrorist that was trying to kill their brothers. Unaware of the danger at the time, the Marines and Iraqi soldiers could take comfort in the fact if they'd have known that two Marines were on watch and would die before they ran. The truck careens to a stop immediately in front of the two Marines. In all of this instantaneous violence, Yale and Her Herder never hesitated. They never stepped back. They never even started to step back. They never shifted their weight. With their feet spread shoulder width apart, they leaned into the fire and fired as fast as they could. They had only, at this point, one second to live. And then the truck explodes, the camera goes blank, and the two young men go to their God. Six seconds. Not enough time to think about their country or their flag or about their lives or their deaths, but more than enough time for two very brave young men like your sons and daughters like your brothers and sisters, like your spouses, two very brave young men to do their duty for eternity. That is the kind of people who are on watch for us all over the world tonight. That is the kind of young men and women that came from your families. 
And I end tonight by saying to you all that when future generations ask why America is still free in the heyday of these terrorists and their allies was counted in days rather than centuries as they said, as they proclaimed would work or would happen, that our hometown heroes, our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our coast guardsmen, our marines, that they can say because of me and people like me who risked all to protect millions, millions who will never know my name, that's why we still have an America. And for those of you tonight and all of the families who have lost the light of their lives, they can say to every American that it was my boy or it was my girl who stood their post and did their duty <clears throat> into eternity. Wow, unbelievable. Um, brings to life one of my favorite quotes ever. If not me, then who? If not now, then when? Unbelievable, superb stuff. Ladies, gents, um, thanks for checking in once again. Um, just to give you an update on the, the giveaway, I've, I've made contact with Matt. So, Matt, congratulations. Um, painting's getting signed at the minute by, by the, the artist, David Rowlands. Um, he's going to send it to me and then I'm going to send it out. Miraculously, amazingly, Matt lives... Matt lives in and around the area where where um, Bob Hughes was from. So I've now got a direct link into the time. Um, update on that Bob Hughes piece. I'm, I'm also I'm speaking to other people within the town. I'm trying to, trying to track down his family. Keep sharing the video if you can. Let's, let's get it out there. I want to do a follow-up with with somebody from bob hughes's family and, and find out a little bit more about this one um guys i'll see you all again very soon have a good one goodbye now